Okay, all right, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. This is uh, the Barrett Middle School Neighbor Meeting on August 26, 2020. My name is Keith Reed. I'm a communication specialist here for San Juan Unified School District. And uh, wanted to just let you know who your panel is today. As I'm sharing my screen. So with us tonight, we have our principal at Barrett Middle School, Amy Alexander Carter. She's going to speak in just a moment about, um, from the school perspective, what this project means. We have our assistant superintendent of facilities, maintenance and transportation, Frank Camarda, joining us tonight. Uh, Nick Arps is our director of facilities construction and modernization. Uh, Michael Barber is our district construction manager on the project. Meredith Collins is our uh, representative from ICS, which is our construction management firm on the project. Uh, Max Medina and Austin Dunkley are here from WL, sorry, WLC Architects. And uh, Max is gonna go through a full uh, presentation on the project with you. And he can also answer some of your questions on the engineering of the project. Uh, Ellen Kelton and Ryan Anderson from our contractor, Landmark Construction are here. And they'll uh, go over some of the um, construction logistics tonight. And Matthew Gherkin from AECOM will be here as well to uh, talk about some of the environmental impacts of the project and our reports on that. Um, I know in the audience tonight, we also have a board member, Zima Creason, uh, joining us for this meeting. Uh, so with that, I am going to hand it over to Nick. But first, I also wanted to remind you all that uh, Please sign up if you haven't already for email communication at www.sanjuan.edu slash Barrett mod. This is going to be uh, an email list where I send updates about construction. Things are going to um, impact our neighbors on a daily basis during the construction process, whether that's an early morning concrete pour or uh, compaction work that might you might actually feel at your house uh, during the project kind of give you a heads up on uh, what's happening and when it's happening and also other events and things like the groundbreaking ceremony if we're able to have one ribbon cuttings and other showcases and events and again the website stanwan.edu slash barrett mod and all of our information's there um, for the project um, I'm going to hand it over to Nick Arps now. Nick. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Um, I want to do a quick little history before I turn it over to Amy um, so she can speak about the school in a little bit more detail. Obviously, Barrett's an older school, built in 1957. There's been a couple small mods throughout the campus, but back when we did the facilities master plan for the last bond measure, for measure P, we established uh, some needs at the school site. Um, we had a large community input on that bond measure and the facilities master plan. Uh, two of the biggest ones were additional parking, drop off, as well as a proper gymnasium with the stage. And so as you'll see tonight, when we get to the presentation, um, Max will kind of walk you through and show you how we've accomplished those two items. And obviously those items, address a lot of concerns that we're sure you guys have for tonight. Um, but I'll turn it over to Amy for her to speak a little bit and then I'll touch on a couple more things before we get into the meat and potatoes of the architect portion of it. Amy? You're on mute, Amy. Yes, I, I always forget that. <laughs> Hello and good evening. Well, this has been a really exciting journey for Barrett staff and myself. Um, we have greatly appreciated the meetings that the construction team has had with us and getting our input and then coming back every few months and creating an image of what Barrett will be will look like in in, in the future. Um, it's really exciting and it's a great opportunity for our students to be able to get uh, a new science wing with some state of, state of the art stuff in it, um, having a new gym. Um, one of the most exciting pieces is having a larger parking lot 
which will greatly improve the flow of traffic because that is one of the challenges that Barrett faces every morning and every afternoon. Um, we greatly appreciate the team and San Juan um, for making this, this happen. And every time we meet, I am always amazed at the pictures that we see because they keep making Barrett look better and better. So we as a staff, we are so excited and I hope our community is excited also. Thank you. Thanks, Sammy. And just uh, before we move to the next part, I do also want to remind everybody here, all of our attendees and guests, that um, if you have a question that is on the top of your mind as we go forward, uh, go ahead and use that Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen on Zoom and type that in and uh, all of our panelists will be able to see it. And when we get to the Q&A part of the night uh, after the presentation, We'll answer those questions the best we can. And uh, we'll also, uh, at the end of the night, give you an opportunity to hit the raise your hand button next to your name. And if you raise your hand, uh, I can click on it and call you out and uh, allow you to speak so that you can uh, ask us a question here uh, on, the, on the meeting. So, um, so those are ways that you can have some of your questions answered here tonight. Uh, so with that, Nick. Thanks, Keith. So I want to start by uh, apologizing that this meeting, obviously, we, we were hoping to have it last year, if not at the beginning of the year. Um, we started this process. A lot of neighbors probably got a flyer April of 2019 with a little bit of rendering. A, a lot has happened since then. Um, the original architect we had on the job, unfortunately, had to depart uh, from the project. So we, we kind of had a step back. Um, we picked up another architect, WLC, which we are currently using at Del Paso Manor and are doing a phenomenal job and picked up the ball and we had to kind of restart some of our staff meetings and kind of refocus on what do we want Barrett to look like. Um, in that process, we had multiple staff meetings at the site, evaluating the original master plan. Um, like we spoke before, Kind of the big items were the parking lot, a dedicated gym, which every, you know, for the middle school that has a stage, um, some additional classrooms, science, you know, science wing for the students and kind of an overall mod, just, you know, obviously with it being built in 1957, it, it needed some upkeep on it. So as we brought the new architect on board, um, we were delayed on that. As part of the process for this project, we, did the procurement as a lease lease back for the contractor and not to get too much detail on a lease lease back. Um, it's a process that districts allowed to do is one of the tools that they're allowed for procurement that allows them to pre qualify the contractor and sit down and basically do an interview. And that way you can kind of establish and score a contractor that would be best suited for the project. And thankfully we had landmark uh, won the opportunity for this project. We're currently working with Landmark on another modernization that's going exceptionally well. So that happened over, I believe, winter break for us to get them on board. And one of the key things with the lease lease back is it allows us to bring the contractor on board early. So they're part of the team. They help with design criteria, uh, constructability, and most crucially, investigation. Um, they go out there, do a little bit of digging, do a little inspection, opening up the walls, just to make sure we know what we're doing when we go to open up the wall. We don't have any surprises and it really helps streamline the process um, so we can have a, a cleaner finished product and we don't have any surprises. Once we got to that point after the new year, then kind of our next step is engaging with the Division of State Architects and California Department of Ed to kind of just get a pre-meeting with them before we submit the project to make sure we're going down the right path we don't have any conflicts with code. And that way, when we go back to present this project to the community, there's no surprises. The state's not gonna have us move something. And then we gotta come back to the community and say, well, the, the project's kind of changed. So we do a lot of dotting I's and crossing T's as we go through the process. So we get to a point where we can show the community uh, a very feasible product at the end. Um, then unfortunately, COVID-19 happened 
uh, after the new year, which really made us kind of, we had to step back, focus on our current projects that were going on. Um, There's a lot of hoops for us to jump through, uh, establishing them as essential projects to stay active through that time. So any projects that were in design got put on the back burner until we kind of navigated what the workforce was gonna look like for COVID-19. Luckily, it wasn't as bad as we thought. Um, we have a lot of exceptional contractors that worked as team members with us to navigate through those times. And now with staff returning, we're, we, it allowed us to get back up and running. We had another meeting with the county to ask a couple questions with them on uh, transportation, stormwater control, mitigation items. And we finally get to the point where now we're, we're able to present this to the community. But it's definitely later in the game than we would like. Um, ideally, it would have been at the new year or later of last year. So, um, you know, and as we do these community meetings, we always want to engage the direct neighbors that are most impacted on the project. Because um, you guys are going to be the ones that are going to be dealing with it day in and day out but with the construction. You know, there's, there's noise, there's dust. It, it's it's not perfect. Um, so you'll have, uh, as we'll go into a little bit detail later, uh, construction schedule that Landmark will go through. Um, but we just wanna make you fully aware of all the things that we've kind of learned as we've done these projects and keep you as informed as possible so there's no surprises for you guys. And that's kind of where we're at this point. Um, so I'm really excited to turn it over to Max to kind of show you guys this project. Um, they did a phenomenal job kind of keeping some of the charm of Barrett, uh, modernizing a lot of the existing, and then adding some of those key features that was needed, but somewhat hiding them so they're not as visible as possible. Um, so with that said, obviously, like Keith said, uh, have those questions come in. We're going to be looking at them as we go through this presentation and answer them at the end, um, but I'll turn it over to Max. Hi, this is me here. So um, I'm going to just take a moment to share screen. Uh, make sure I got it the right spot here. Screen two, I think. There you go. And I'm just going to tee something up while I'm talking a little bit. I'm going to, um, as I introduce my team a little bit here. Let's see. There you go. Okay. Got it. So I want to introduce, uh, first of all, I'm Max Medina, principal with WLC Architects, and um, I'm just happy to do this. This is what I've been doing for quite a number of years through my life and career. I want to acknowledge Austin Dunkley, who's part of our architectural team. And there's a whole host of a bunch of engineers and, and all sorts of other people working on this project on the design part. Tom Fossbender is one of them. He's on the, uh, the meeting right now. So I just want to acknowledge those guys. One of the things that I really have a passion doing when we, when we do things like this is to never lose focus on who this is for. Primarily it's for kids. We need to take care of all those issues about education and we, we think we do, um, but also address physically all the, all the issues that, that go around the school site. It's a big deal. And all we want to do is improve everything that's here since it's existing. It's not all brand new. It's part existing and part brand new to make a better campus for the neighborhood. So I'm going to go ahead and start um, a presentation that's going to take about 15 minutes. We might go long, uh, a little bit longer if, if uh, you know, there's electronic issues, but I'll try to get through this and be very clear about what we're doing. Um, the, the background in back of um, Keith was, let me make sure. The background in back of Keith is as if he was hovering like a drone over the site. This photo right here is a picture of what you would see if you're on the south property line looking north above the whole school. Barrett Road is on the far right. That's not the parking lot there. In fact, there's another outside in the green space. There should be a, a street out there, which would be Barrett Road. You can see your existing parking lot on, on, on the right side. If you draw a line right down the center of this picture, to the right of that line is the existing school. Every building is going to remain except one building in the middle, 
which we call the middle finger is being removed. All the portables on the south property line are being removed and that's pretty much it. Everything to the left of that line is we call new construction. There's a brand new um, gymnasium, multi-purpose stage, band room, locker room, boys and girls, and across the, the quad is also a new science building. Those constitute very significant things in an educational program that make your old Barrett school a true middle school. Mainly the, the thing that defines a middle school uh, proper for uh, education today and, and, and forever was it had to have good multi-purpose space. The classrooms, we know what they are, administration, we know what they are, uh, library and all those sorts of things. But without a multi-purpose for feeding and another room for all the other activities you do, you really don't have a, uh, a, a viable middle school. This one does it, finally. Okay. Uh, let me talk about some of the the features on the site, then I'll go into the building uh, after this. So there's currently you have about 50 parking spaces that are only on the existing parking lot and a little bit on the south. With the removal of the portables, we've created a scheme that keeps your existing parking lot and improves it and also adds a lot more parking on the south side where we vacated um, the portables. This does a couple of things. No longer will the neighbors to the south have a bunch of classrooms that are near them, but you're separated from the main campus by a, you know, a, a several rows of parking, uh, which, are, which would be pretty quiet. There is no parking on the south property fence wall. It's only driveway. You can't see it on this photo, but there's nobody backing up onto that wall or anything like that. That's purposeful so that, again, we're trying to uh, respect the neighbors and, and all those sorts of things. The purpose of this big parking lot is, to, is for the district to take responsibility for all the kids and all the traffic and by bringing everything on site. And that's a big key in school design where we know that old schools have been designed with less cars way back then. Their responsibility today is to take all those cars that are now and bring them on site. So we're, we're basically creating a new school on site. Everybody gets to, if you look at my cursor, can everybody see that, by the way? There's new sidewalk drop-off against the entire campus, against the, against the, the um, driveways. That's all for school drop-off. Right now, you only have the front drop-off. Uh, the new parking lot scheme, we have 157 parking spaces. That's three times more than you have now. Studies have shown that uh, on a regular day, a school campus like this gets about 60 to 80 cars circulating through, this park, through their parking lots. We've already experienced that on other schools that we've done in the district. It's about 60 to 80, and we've documented that. So we think this parking lot will handle all of that, bringing as you train the community to use this parking lot properly, they will be off the street they will be able to park, they will be able to drop off and get everybody on site safely and then exit safely to the, to the two uh, driveways that you currently have and they are not changing, they remain the same. One is in, the other one's out. The difference being on an, any given day, all the traffic is gonna be on site and all you'll see in the street, hopefully when, you're, when, you're, when the culture uh, gets, gets used to this, is cars entering and cars exiting. And that's the design. Um, let's see. So I talked about safe dropped offs. I talked about the, the, the number of parking stalls are intentional because with a new multi-purpose room in the back, this gives the ability of everybody not parking in the neighborhood to go to possibly a, an, you know, after school event and use the parking lot properly way in the back, get them off the street and go to their event, which might, might be most likely the multi-purpose room. Um, there's also an easement on the south side, which we've maintained, we haven't even touched. There happens to be a well there that we know that um, not district vehicles, but um, um, other water district vehicles go there occasionally to get there and we've, we've given them that access. Also the, ball, the fields are still green. We're suggesting that there's soccer out there possibly, which there is now. Um, there's also a, uh, the existing baseball diamond, which is there. And, Right now we're showing a walk path that goes around the perimeter up against the fence line to, for, for a PE purpose and, 
there's no room for a proper track back here, but that's that's what serves PE. Also, the the current um, your current playground, which would be left of right left of center, is in about this area, and we pushed all of the hardscape basketball courts and all those things further out to the east, to the west. Okay, that took a little long. <laughs> so I want to uh, describe some of the features, the classrooms. Your administration building is, is properly taking taking charge of the corner of the school on site. As everybody enters, they will be able to drop off and they will see the front door of the school right there. If they don't get to drop off on the main parking lot, they'll be able to turn around and, and go circulate around the parking lot and drop off there. The administration building definitely wants to see all of that happen. Um, and you'll see photos of that. The multi-purpose room gets a new roof. Uh, all these classrooms remain the same. We reconfigured um, some of them, but they're, they basically remain classrooms. One of the big features about this is the vacation of the middle finger. And it's a big deal and you'll see it more in better photos, but it becomes a lunch quad, something that the school uh, the kids don't have right now. Your multi-purpose room will be able to serve outdoor lunch as well as indoor lunch and be dedicated for lunch mostly. No kids should be um, venturing out towards the parking lot. Everybody is contained inside the campus. A new academic quad is what we call is between the new gymnasium and science building. This is basically the heart of the school where a lot of the kids will be circulating. They can have outdoor assemblies um, and all those sorts of things that happen on a quad that you never had. And we think this is a great improvement. The quad also serves as for emergency vehicles to come in in the middle of the campus like a fire truck. If there was an event like that, they could get in there, stage, put out fires or do rescues if necessary. So it's not, it's a very safe quad that we've designed there. Um, let me see what else here. I'll go to the next slide. This is what you might see when you're getting dropped off at the front door. Um, that's the front, that happens to be your current um, art room and I believe uh, media uh, room, I think, but, but it's the art room. This building is totally gutted. It's one of the modernization buildings that, that totally gets gutted to the ground and then we're gonna build, build it renewed. You'll see the interior of that later, but that's everybody, every visitor um, should filter right through that front door and that's the only way they can get on campus and then circulate through the lobby, check in, and then they'll be behind the gates to be released if, if necessary or kids can come into that lobby the same way from the back side. Here's another view as you're trying to turn the corner around the school. You can see a familiar um, arch building there, which is your multi-purpose room, which gets a new roof cleaned up. As you, if you're leaving, this is what you might see. This is the exit driveway uh, standing out there almost near the street. Now I'm circulating to a, an area that you're not familiar with, but where you're, you just drove right over the portables that are, that are there now. They're not there anymore. You're going towards the back of the campus where this major building is, and it's to the back for a reason. The biggest building on campus is toward the back so it doesn't impact the neighborhood and, and doesn't create those kinds of tall building issues or, or a lot of traffic issues. We're pushing all that towards the back. Kids can get dropped off. As you get dropped off, you might, this could be the view as if you're getting dropped off as a kid or uh, a, a parent leaving the campus to go to exit or for an evening event or after school event if you park and walk into the multi-purpose room. Once you're on campus and dropped off, this happens to be at a spot right in front of the exist, not well in the backside under the hallway of the uh, uh, administration office currently. So if you're looking at the middle finger that we just moved, the, the middle finger classroom that we just removed, it would be turned into a lunch quad. To the right of this, on the right side, it doesn't show right here, but the uh, underneath the hallway, the existing hallway in back of the um, kitchen, we're creating a, um, a serving window so kids can come there and get lunch if they want to just get lunch and then walk right out here. If you notice the building on the other side of the quad, it's the back side of one of the classrooms, all cleaned up. The noisy air conditioners are gone and we just have clean windows and clean wall um, in, in this. It, it almost looks brand new and that, that's kind of what we're trying to do here. Um, here, you're really underneath one of the shade structures. The shade structure that we picked here is, is um, conceptual right now. We might have it a little bit more closed, 
but the purpose here is to make sure that um, we serve all the kids either inside or outside. And we've done the numbers and they're, they're gonna be making a big impact on how they serve here, uh, uh, serve all those kids here in terms of lunches. You can see far beyond, way down in the back is, is the brand new quad um, between the gymnasium and the science building, way back there. This is right on the edge. If you look to the right, the right side of this, far right of it, would be the old school. Um, to the left is obviously venturing into the new school. What you're doing is looking in the quad uh, right across is the science building. If you notice, there's some steps on the right. The campus does drop about four to six feet from the existing campus all the way to the playgrounds. We're making up the steps or the grade with a few steps here and there, and they can be used as a little mini amphitheater by just having steps. And that's a feature that you don't have now, but it's something that Amy was very excited about to just say, let's have an assembly, seat the kids there, and, and, and you have an automatic um, uh, assembly. Um, if you look across the quad from the other opposite direction, you're looking back at the gymnasium. Um, I would say that we've broken the scale down of that building. A gym, gymnasiums are usually big, tall boxes, but the way we've treated it is to bring down the scale and make sure that you don't have the sense of like there, there's a big two-story building on campus because there's not. Um, the gym would be the, the middle portion of, uh, with the overhang. On the left side of that would be the new band, choir, and drama rooms. Looking across the quad, you see you're basically looking straight across right into a door into the gym. One of the things that we wanted this gym to do was have a lot of light. Um, if you know your existing multi-purpose gym, there's not a lot of light in there, unfortunately, but we wanted to make this as airy as possible, and you'll see that photo later. The, this little ramp here, it's not a ramp, but it's just a slope grade, but that's the sense of how, how much your campus drops across, um, you know, across the length, uh, the, the length of it. A <clears throat> little bit of detail looking into the front door of the science building, which is across the way from the gym. They kind of look at each other. We call those buildings looking at each other. They're both looking onto the quad. And that room right there happens to be like a lobby or a, we call it a flex space. It's a little bit of a bonus space for the science department, which is really new. It's got all new labs, all new science labs, and, and it's an exciting building. Uh, they're all bigger than what, what, what's there now. Another shot of building R, which we call the science building. So you can see the quad is quite expansive, and this is not this is not the play courts. This is actually where kids can congregate and cross uh, when they move to and from classes. Okay. If we step way back onto the play field, I'm basically on the far farthest western edge of the new playground. Looking back at the campus, um, it's quite open. It's quite, you know, there's all the facilities that you have now. Um, but a neat feature that we have because of, this, because of the drop in grade are these steps. One of the things that the PE department, it's gonna be a very nice PE department with, the, with real full locker rooms, uh, boys and girls coming out the back and they get the stage back here and they can, there's actually even more space for them to sit and maybe even have a PE class on the steps or the you know, coaches can address the kids in an outdoor fashion rather than always being indoors. This is a bonus that we, again, we use because of the, the opportunities of grade changes. We're gonna go do some interior shots now. Um, this is what you would see if you went right into the front lobby. On the left side, you would have entered the door that got you in and you'd be greeted by a front desk. Uh, it'll be modeled after what we did at Del Paso Manor, but basically the, the front desk needs to command the front of the school. In this case, if you are sitting right there behind the desk where the gentleman is sitting, you see the parking lot through that big window and if you're looking back towards that, towards uh, where the photo's taken, you're looking, into the campus and you probably can see a little bit of the quad. I don't think I have that view, but you can imagine that right now. Um, this is the multi-purpose room. Now, it's mostly gonna be dedicated for food and that's purposeful because you already have a gym on the other side. This will keep this, this room a little bit cleaner. Um, it'll, you won't have to break down tables and all those sorts of things that, uh, all the time. It'll still have a basketball court in case they need an overflow basketball court, but this gives 
Amy and all the staff a lot of extra flexibility in, in other types of multi-purpose or big gathering spaces. For example, if you had, if you needed an assembly and the gym was being used, but you needed people indoors because it was raining, you could have that, that meeting in here uh, without difficulty. On the left side here, if this was set up for lunch, through that roll up door on the left, they would pull out carts and, 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 and tables and milk carts that would uh, be right here and you'd have a serving line uh, for the kids for indoors. Okay. This is, a, this is an existing classroom. I would have to say we, we're, we're, we're happy with what we're doing with this. It's gonna be well insulated, better lighting, um, new finishes, better visual, uh, better um, um, technology. And the only thing that's really wrong with these rooms now and even in our finished state is that it's just a shorter building. I, I have to admit that we did everything we could on this classroom to make it modern, to give it everything we can give it. The size is even uh, generally okay, but they are short and we're, we're making the best of it by giving you all the light that we can. And it'll, it'll be safe light, there'll be blinds here for safety reasons and, and all that sort of thing. So that's just a, a basic interior of a, of a classroom. Another basic interior, this is a new, class, new, new science building. This is not a classroom, but this happens to be a portion of the entry, which we call a flex lab. This is where kids might gather and do a little bit of study hall or even come out um, and, and share projects with, with the rest of the science program. As you can see, it does look into the quad, so there's a greater area of, you know, the, you can share robotics out in that quad also by bringing your science project from inside to outside. Um, this is the gymnasium and multi-purpose. On the left is the stairs to, uh, to the stage, full court basketball court, two cross courts, um, bleachers on one side. Right down in the middle of the bleachers on the far end is the entrance to the locker rooms. You go one way, you got boys. You go the other way, you got girls. Pretty simple. If you're sitting on the bleachers, this is what you would look like if you're watching a basketball game or a volleyball game or um, you could even be in a, uh, an assembly where the, the, the floor would be filled with chairs and you could still use these as bleachers if you'd like. This is the airiness that we talked about in this gym. A little bit different than what you have now, but there's um, lighting on the north side, lighting on the south side, and they're well shaded so you're not getting direct sunlight to heat this up. Um, I might add all, the, all buildings, including the modernization buildings, are getting all brand new air conditioning, all just fresh air a uh, better quality environment for the kids.
I turn it over and, and finish this part of the presentation, um, I just want to say everything we've done in terms of addressing an existing program and an existing facility and existing condition, we've made, we've tried to make better. Parking, classes, um, circulation, safety with fencing, everything that, that you might not see, but that's, that, that's the intent, that's the job of an architect to do. So we hope we captured all those comments. We hope we um, satisfied a lot of those things. And our schedule is in terms of the drawings and design is we'll be at, at the state architect in the next month and a half. Um, so we're just doing final uh, brush up of, of, uh, and refinements to the design at this point. I'd like to turn it to over to uh, Landmark Construction who is going to talk about how this gets um, constructed. Thanks, Max. Um, mm -hmm. Let me bring up, let me share my screen um, so I can show you some of our phasing. All right. Hey everybody, I am Ellen Kelton and I'm joined by Ryan Anderson from Landmark Construction and we're really excited to be part of this team. Um, really excited about the Barrett project. Um, in addition to be, being part of the construction team, um, I'm also a Barrett neighbor. Um, I'm a Barrett graduate and my daughter is currently an eighth grader at Barrett. So this project is really, um, really exciting for me personally. So a little bit about Landmark. We are first and foremost a school builder. 100% um, of our work is K through 12 construction and all of our team uh, were well versed in the challenges of construction on uh, campuses that are uh, full of students and uh, neighbors right next door to us on either side. Um, in the area, Ryan and several of our team members have recently built, uh, Nick mentioned, um, we've built, uh, we're finishing up at Little John down Dewey. Um, we've also built at Del Deo, two classroom buildings and Marimont. So we know how invested the community is, um, our community. Um, and we're really glad to be a part of these improvements. Um, for Barrett, we have been working on a logistics and safety plan since before we were ordered the project. And let me switch over to that. Um, I have lived the, the, the traffic nightmare on Barrett during drop off and pick up um, for most of my life. And we're gonna do everything that we can not to contribute to that. Um, so let me take you through our phasing. So first of all, we've got our temporary access road um, here. This is Barrett here, and we're entering the site um, off of Barrett, um, and then going down to our trailer and staging area here. Um, and we purposely position that um, away from the school entrance and exit, completely separate. Um, we're, we're coming in off of um, winding, heading down Barrett and then we're getting right off of Barrett right away, getting that traffic um, here. Um, we'll also have our separate lay down area, separate parking for our staff, um, so that we're not impacting any of the, the parking on site. Um, all of this is gonna be uh, fenced. It'll be, there'll be a gate at the entrance here. We'll have signage with um, our contact information in case there's an emergency. Um, and um, Keith mentioned earlier, there's a good notification process that the, the, the district has in place. Um, if we have activities that we're gonna be doing that might be outside of normal hours um, or particularly intrusive, we'll notify, make that notification. Um, but of course, in case of emergency, um, you'll always be able to get a hold of us. So as soon as we get our temporary access set up, um, our trailer pulled in, we will start on the new construction. So um, we've got science here and the multi-purpose here. We'll be accessing that work 
um, as you saw in the previous slide over to the left, um, just right here, not from the front at all um, and not from this existing parking lot um, to the south. And while we are working on the new classroom buildings, which the, the duration on those is about a year, um, we will also be modernizing the site going through um, uh, and that'll be phased, um, but that work will be happening concurrently. Towards the tail end of the project, um, we will be completing the new parking drop-off area. Um, this is, that's going to be happening um, after we've completed the, the new classroom buildings. Um, most likely that's going to be happening uh, during summer because, of course, you're impacted as far as existing parking and the, the drop-off congestion right now. So um, that'll, that'll most likely happen uh, predominantly in the summer. Um, our overall goal and approach to the project is to get the project built safely and efficiently as possible. We know that there's going to be, um, there will be some, some challenges, some disruption that comes with any construction project. Um, but our, our goal is really to be good neighbors, be approachable and available. If you've got questions, um, it's very important to us to uh, get in, get these improvements done so that everyone can enjoy them. Yeah, I think you uh, you hit on pretty much everything, Ellen. Um, we just want everyone to know uh, the goal as contractors is to have the least amount of impact as possible to the surrounding community during uh, the construction. We're really excited about being a part of this project and uh, we can see by the poll results, most of the neighbors have the biggest concern regarding uh, the daily traffic pickup and drop off. Um, the current plan is to perform a traffic survey prior to construction starting. It's a little difficult to do right now, obviously, due to the COVID-19 uh, impacts and the distance learning with the uh, children not coming to school. Um, hopefully they do come back and we can take this traffic survey just to determine what that looks like prior to construction beginning. And then in order to have the least amount of impact as possible during uh, construction. So. Uh, that's the, the, the daily uh, Barrett schedule is something that we distribute to our subcontractors um, and that is posted on the wall of all of our trailers um, and I know that none of none of our construction team want to contribute to that. Nobody wants to sit in traffic of course. That was, that was um, everything I have. Okay, thanks, uh, Ellen. Appreciate that. That brings us to our uh, Q&A session. We do have a few questions in our Q&A chat feature. And at this time, if anybody does want to uh, ask their question verbally, please use the raise your hand feature. And uh, we'll get you in to ask your question verbally as well. But uh, as well, you start to think about that. Um, the first question we had on the Q&A came from Paul Reese, and his question is, has an independent traffic study been done to analyze the impact on morning or afternoon traffic along Barrett Road, given the expansion of the parking lot and ingress being limited to the existing main entrance? Max or Matthew, would that be your ballpark? The, um, the uh, oh, hold on a second, am I muted? Meredith, I'm going to ask you something about traffic studies prior on CEQA. Was there anything like that? Is... Matt Gherkin is on the phone. Okay. Um, he was yeah, our yeah. AD mom and he was our CEQA consultant. So he can probably lend some to that. Yeah, sometimes we uh, have a traffic study done for different development projects or school projects, uh, particularly when there are, are capacity expansions or where it's a new development uh, where there's a need to focus on queuing, where there's a need to focus on particular intersections, whether signalization is necessary, et cetera. Um, in this instance, since it's an existing uh, school, um, existing uh, capacity, no capacity um, expansions, 
uh, CEQA doesn't require anything by way of a, of a traffic study, but that's not to say that the district wouldn't uh, recommend that a particular study was conducted to look at our individual issue, be it queuing, uh, the survey uh, prior to, uh, uh, to inform uh, management actions later on, that could all be uh, germane looking forward. Well, and currently our meetings with Sacramento County, they have Department of Transportation with Sacramento County. They've indicated that a traffic study isn't required. Doesn't mean that the district won't be doing one. And as Ryan said, it's hard to do it right now with a not active school and active campus. Um, but we will be working on uh, doing traffic information as far as enrollment, where the houses are and how kids are accessing the site, whether it be from the north end or the south end. And we have those numbers that we're passing along to Sacramento County at this point. I will say on the architects or design side, in order to you know, do our own site assessment, um, we observe, we got a little bit before COVID started, we did see and observe a couple of um, morning and, and pickup times in the afternoon. So my data, based on what we did like on Del Paso, for example, which has three streets that feed into that school, so I would, I would say this is probably a little bit less, not, not, not less severe, but um, the issues that you have are cars in the neighborhood across the street circulating through just to drop off. They, they happen to hide back there because it's a place to go. The cars along the street and in both directions and, you know, the pedestrian traffic that we try to mitigate. Um, I have numbers on what those are and this site in terms of the parking and the amount of drop-off lane tries to fit everybody that was on the streets on site. So the idea here is to get everybody not just off the street, but off that other neighborhood too. And, and so those issues that, uh, that come up about the numbers of cars, the number of people, the numbers of bikes even are on campus safely. And, and there's room for it on the scheme. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for those answers. The next question on the Q&A chat is from Lindy Richardson. It says, uh, will the temporary road be paved? That's the access road that Ellen mentioned in her At this time, it's, we're not planning on paving it. Uh, it. It's still an option on the table. It would most likely be compacted rock uh, to eliminate or to mitigate dust control measures. We plan on having a water truck daily uh, street sweepers when necessary, uh, fence fabric. Um, so dust control wise, we would, that would be one of our main priorities, especially since we're going along the, uh, the perimeter of the north neighbors and the neighbors to the west. And the same, uh, same question, uh, how close to the west homeowners will that road be built? Also from Lindy. Uh, plus or minus 20 feet to the west and to the north. Okay. And uh, the next question comes from uh, Lori Ratz. Uh, when is the, I hope I pronounced that name correctly, when is the construction starting? Uh, we start are looking, we're looking to hopefully um, mobilize in the May of next year, May or beginning of June of next year. And it would run through December, 2022, January 23. Okay. Um, the next question that we have on the Q and A is from Lori who also has her hand raised. So rather than read, uh, she has a couple questions here. So rather than read, I will access her microphone so that she can uh, ask them verbally. Lori, it looks like you're muted at the moment, but you are allowed to speak. I think you have to unmute yourself, Lori. It looks like you're good to talk. Lori, are you there? I'm here, can you hear me? Uh, very lightly. Can you, do you have a microphone or? Can you... 
Uh, no. Can I, can everybody hear Lori? I can I can barely hear her. Lori, do you want me to come back to you? You can answer the questions I've typed so far. Okay, so Lori has asked, uh, why has the district told a neighbor attached to the easement that she must sign over her rights to the easement for the project to proceed? For that one, I'm, I'm unsure of the question, but there are um, a couple of items that we'll be working with individual neighbors, um, access to their property for that but it's currently not holding up the project. Um, Lori also asked, has there been any observation during facilities usage? Does anybody, I'm not sure if, when Lori's microphone gets up, maybe she can explain that one a little bit um, further. I could take a stab in terms of um, what we've observed to, you know, see the design. We've seen, you know, how they eat lunch. We've seen how um, the classrooms function. We've seen how the courtyards are, you know, and the playgrounds and those sorts of things. So, again, using that information to try to improve the conditions if they needed improving. So there has been observation made by just normal um, walking through the campus and, and at certain times. Uh, if okay. I could chime in, I think if we're talking about facility use for after hours for youth sports or events like that, I think uh, Principal uh, Carter can talk about uh, the types of uh, facility use that she has right now uh, and the types of uh, programs that are uh, the after school programs. Um, as far as the um, facility use on the weekends, uh, I don't have the facility use calendars in front of me at, the at, the, at, at this point. Uh, to talk about the types of um, uh, youth sports leagues that use Barrett currently, but that's something that I could provide for the neighborhood uh, to, to let them know the types of facility use. I'm sure they're aware of what goes on in their neighborhood, but as far as a calendar of events, um, I don't have that information, but I've had to share it, but I think Ms. Carter uh, can talk about the types of use after school programs or facility use, and she may even be able to talk about the weekend facility use as well. So, uh, Principal Carter, would you be able to explain a little bit about the after school facility use? Are the big, um, our soccer is the big sport that uses our fields um, after school during soccer season. Um, and then we run our sports pr programs um, through Parks and Rec. Um, but that, is pr pretty much it. Sometimes we have um, AAU basketball coaches will do a f facilities use through the district, but um, soccer is pretty much consistent. That's our, our big one. A few more questions um, from uh, Lori also asking if uh, the expanded gym and the new gym, if there would be multiple events at once, potentially after school. And also from Lori Bratz again, um, will lights be installed around the soccer field area? The answer to the lights is no, we're not gonna install any uh, field lights. Yeah, we, we don't typically um, install uh, middle school level uh, any uh, sports facility lighting. Um, we're currently in discussions with the county about uh, requests for street lighting along the frontage of the school, um, but otherwise we just light our standard buildings um, in our in our areas. And what we've noticed in our specifications that when we do lighting of our buildings, we have specific light fixtures that are downward directed as well as they're on timers and they dim after a certain time and are motion activated. So they're, they're not on 24 seven um, all night. Okay. Uh, the Cunninghams ask, uh, Max mentioned that they calculate traffic flow through the lots at 60 to 80 cars per hour. At the rush times, cars come and go in about 20 minutes. 
How does this fit into your planning? That's pretty close to the data that we observed. It's not 60 to 80 cars per hour. It's 60 to 80 cars total. And it takes them about, I've observed it as, as, as small as 15 minutes to 20 minutes. Uh, and I was surprised it's 20 minutes is pretty much tops in terms of how long it takes everybody to get in and out of a, a drop off or pickup situation. So it does fit in our planning. So if, in theory, if, if we're correct, um, this would happen faster, easier, or less with less uh, event. Okay, it looks like uh, we have Paul Reese uh, with his hand raised. So I'm going to allow Paul to talk right now. Paul, you're going to have to unmute yourself. I'm unmuted. Hopefully, you can hear me. Yeah, we can. Great. Um, I'm, I'm concerned a little bit with the 60 to 80 car estimate because that's on other campuses. Uh, we've lived in this neighborhood. We're on Pinecrest, so we're on the circle immediate, immediately opposite the school. We've been here since the uh, early 90s, and we've seen a significant increase in the number of cars, the number of commuters. Uh, I don't know this for sure, but I think parents from Gold River uh, uh, use Barrett as their school, and they're going to be commuting. They're going to be dropping the kids off here at the school. So I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm strongly uh, recommending that you guys do a traffic study because uh, I, I just, you know, I, I don't want to take your assurance that traffic at this school is not going to get worse uh, with this construction, with the, moder uh, with the modernization. I'm a, I'm a parent of uh, uh, one Barrett graduate back in the late 90s, and I'm also a graduate of Barrett. I went to the school back in 68. So I really like what you're planning on doing with the school. I just want to make sure that emergency vehicles can get into my street uh, during the hours of uh, drop off and pick up. And I want to make sure that you know, our lives aren't any more disrupted than they currently are. The Cunninghams live almost immediately across from the uh, entrance to the school. And uh, the north end of Pinecrest is just a little bit offset from that. You've got three sets of traffic coming right into that, into that section at one particular time. And I think you need to mitigate that in some way. Um, Paul, this is Max again. Uh, yeah. we, that's a great comment. Are you, did you have any more to add? I'm sorry. No, I, I oh, just think, okay. a, I, you yeah. know, not having a formal traffic study on this that can assure me that, uh, that this isn't going to make the project a problem in the future really, you know, doesn't satisfy me. Um, it just makes me feel concerned about, you know, where this is going to go in three, four, five years. Okay, Paul, um, let me, I, I heard a couple of things here. So a lot of the um, design solutions that we've used over the years, and then I'm not saying one size fits all, but they're the result of many other types of studies where we had to answer the same questions the idea of getting cars off the street as much as you can. And, and I, I have to say, in fact, this campus afforded us one of the better opportunities to do that in terms of other comparable district schools. Um, one thing that we, I probably didn't go over, um, when you take cars off the street, that means the street is free for emergency vehicles because they won't have those cars on the street. The on-site driveways that we have are all double lane. They can be all changed to two-way traffic, if you will. And I'm not sure that showed clearly in, in the video, but cars can go, there's, there's room for two lanes of cars passing. In other words, if you're all, if everybody's dropping off on campus, in theory, a, a fire truck or something should even be able to get on campus with that, with that action happening. The, the, the South parking lot really afforded this. So there's a lot of room back there to make double driveways, double loaded parking, and get all that on campus. So that's, again, those are results of resolving questions from other traffic study reports that we've been involved with. Um, we've even taken it to the level of pedestrian traffic where, where there is. Um, not sure, I didn't note it, note it, but there's a southern bike rack 
and a northern bike rack to, to receive kids coming from the north or from the south, just so they don't cross in the middle of the, in, in the front of the campus. So again, everything that we've, to, that we've learned from prior studies is applied right here in, in, in this design. Um, in terms of the amount of traffic coming to school, we did not increase student population here. These facilities are with the same amount of classrooms that are there now. We've just given them um, yes, bigger. Yes, but that didn't change the character of the, uh, of the enrollment from, you know, I know as these neighborhoods age, you lose children in the immediate area. And so you're, my, my sense is that you're bringing more kids in from Gold River to fill the, fill the facility, which is certainly okay, but that means they're commuting. And so that adds to the traffic that you're going to get. It doesn't diminish it. And it doesn't, it doesn't allow it to stay stable. Our experience again yes. is that traffic has gone up. Mr. Rees, if I can address you, this is Frank, I'm the assistant superintendent. Um, yes. I have transfer data that I, I would be glad, glad to show you um, about the uh, resident projections of, of the students that live within the Barrett boundaries. Uh, the population sits at about 800, and then we do have, uh, and that remains stag you know, stagnant for about, you know, about seven years out. I do a demographic study to see what the demographics are going to be for that boundaried area, and it remains about 800. We have a rate of transfer ins, and, the, and the, I can show you where the students are coming from. Uh, I have the data to, show, to share with you that. And I also have data of the students that are leaving the boundaries and attending uh, schools through the open enrollment. Um, so I can pinpoint exactly uh, what you're saying with great accuracy of who's coming from what area. Uh, like uh, Mr. Medina mentioned, uh, we are not. Can you hear me? You broke up a little bit. You're okay now. Okay. My Wi-Fi dropped out for a little bit. Okay. I, I missed the last part of your. Uh, yes, yeah, so so I would be happy to share with you um, the resident uh, demographic data on population density within the boundary, and I can also share with you what's where the students are transferring out of that Barrett boundary, and then where, where they're coming from, and the volume of how many students are coming from outside the Barrett area, and that can inform uh, uh, you know our traffic uh, patterns of who's uh, coming in from outside the area. I have that data to share. Um, I'll be creating new demographic studies within the next couple of months uh, with new enrollment information. And I can share that information with the neighbor uh, and you directly, Mr. Reese, on uh, exactly where the students are coming from within your neighborhood and from outside, your, uh, outside the bounds. And I, I have that data from last year's population and I can do it for this year for you. I, I I would like to see that. Do you have data as of five years ago? Uh, I, I, I have data going back, not the matrix that shows the transfer patterns. Uh, I do have resident population or actual data going back to 2016 uh, about the, the, the data. Um, now we do know that um, uh, the population uh, has changed a little bit as far as uh, you know, going from a neighborhood school and bus access uh, to more car heavy. That's uh, just a symptom of the elimination of home to school transportation, which is unfortunate. Um, so that's why we, we take great effort uh, to work with the designers, the civil engineers, um, to provide as much on site car queuing as we possibly can, uh, knowing the constraints of the neighborhood, knowing the constraints of the size of the streets. Uh, so that's why we take great caution in making sure that we can try to pull as many of those cars off the streets onto our queues for pickup and drop off to relieve that traffic congestion, hopefully relieve people from double parking, parking in people's driveways and disrupting the neighborhoods. And we, we, appreciate, we appreciate that. And, I, and I, I understand all the thought that's gone into this. I, in fact, I think I wrote Nick uh, earlier regarding my uh, my issues. Has any thought been given to creating another ingress point uh, along the north field so that people traveling southbound on Barrett could enter there, uh, enter into the uh, parking lot from that entrance, and then the main entrance could be used for people traveling northbound on Barrett so that you end up with reducing the bottleneck at that main entrance? Yeah, and I, I can speak on that. Um, 
Yeah, I was going to mention to Keith, I, I think we skipped over a couple uh, right end questions. Uh, there was one, I think, about putting the gym up there as well. When we started this process, we looked at a lot of different options, and one of them was putting the gym up on the north playground or uh, grass field area. It, it became problematic with just with it being higher up from the rest of the site, um, it would require an extensive amount of grading that becomes very costly, as well as ADA path to tra travels became problematic. So we, we backed off going down that road because it, it started inflating our budget drastically. And the other issue it caused is the farther we went north, the longer the site got. So it became more difficult for students to get from one site to the one side of the site to the other uh, within the bell schedule you know, that uh, schools typically have. Mm -hmm. Even just a, even just an entrance point there. So, uh, you know, an, an, uh, an access road down into the parking lot would be, you know, it seems to me would reduce the, the traffic on Barrett. Uh, not where you're not where you're building more campus up there, but just an entrance. It, it currently, it's still uh, not cost effective on for to to do it, but it is something that. Um, you mentioned Nick. You mentioned in your piece to me that there were, and I quote. Um, you're also talking with the county on some other options. Could you delineate that? For the county, uh, a couple of the options were the sidewalk path to travel for foot traffic, um, as well as the street lights on there. Obviously, street lights are expensive to line 900 lineal feet of the school, as well as lighting 900 lineal feet of the school pathway. So there's certain items that we're still negotiating with the county. Um, the other one is they had the same concerns that the neighborhood has is making sure we're adequately allowing enough space on site to have cars queue, get off the road, um, really stop dropping people off or dropping students off on the road itself. So we're evaluating and looking at doing some additional fencing to kind of deter parents from dropping their kids off in the street as they won't be able to directly access the school, they would, you know, hit the fence and have to walk all the way north or all the way south to get to an ex or an entrance point. So there's a couple of things that we're talking to the county on trying to mitigate some of those items of the traffic on the road. And getting... uh, see, see, the way I see it right now is you've got probably two thirds of the parents who drop their children off are dropping them off either on Pinecrest or along Barrett or Jan. Uh, one of the neighborhood side streets. So they're, they're dropping them off off campus. Now what you're proposing to do is to bring everybody onto campus through a single entrance, through a single entrance. And that's the problem. Uh, yeah, you're going to have plenty of places on campus to drop them off, but you're gonna have to funnel all those cars onto campus. And that's why we need some sort of independent traffic study because yeah you've you're creating a bottleneck and it's not you know I, I just i can't see it you know I've, I've lived here for a long time and i just can't see this functioning very well uh you know uh, you know I, I i like the idea of of drop off on campus i think that's terrific but you're you're basically trying to incentivize everybody to go through that single entrance and that means long backups on barrett and people will continue behaving the way they, they currently are behaving. For the traffic study, um, I wanna ask Matthew, I just, for everyone on this Zoom, what is typically in a traffic study and how is it conducted? Just so we make sure that when, if we were to do one, we're getting the information that we, we need and that we wanna see. So what's typically in a traffic study and how, how is that put together? It would have traffic counts during a representative period. Um, I don't think that's possible 
at this moment, but it would it would document existing conditions during a representative period, which would involve traffic counts. And usually we also during pickup drop up period would um, have a video taken, sometimes drone video taken so that we can understand in more detail behavior, drop off, pick up behavior in and around the campus, document that all in terms of existing conditions, identify issue areas, queuing areas, uh, backups, et cetera. Then we would have a portion of the uh, traffic study that would look at future conditions, how they would change in the future, how the project itself would change the existing conditions, traffic flow conditions. Um, usually, like I said, we're, we're talking about a, a capacity change or a new project. So that would you know, be really more dramatic changes to conditions. But in this case, we're talking about you know, uh, ingress, egress alterations and what that would do to traffic patterns especially during peak period times. And then the final section uh, would be different strategies if there are uh, issues popping up in that existing plus project scenario, like what does the project do to queuing, to traffic congestion issues. If there are issues, the final section would identify management actions, would identify physical improvements, an additional turn lane, uh, an additional drop off lane, whatever the um, mitigation ideas might be to address issues that are popping up and are identified in the previous sections of the report. That's it in a nutshell. Principal Amy, I've seen you out there. I've seen you out there in the morning with the, with the traffic, you know, we occasionally will, will wave at one another. Uh, so uh, you've, you, you know what, what's happening with the traffic along Barrett. You've seen what, you're, you're trying to increase the, the size of your parking by three times. And you're trying to funnel that many more cars onto the campus. Just from your standpoint, what's that gonna do to the traffic waiting to get into your, into your lot? Well, the part of the reason that parents don't come into the parking lot is because it does get so jam packed. Right. So the hope with the new design is that it's a continual flow. So there would not be such a jam in the morning because I do agree if I'm a little bit late to work, I am stuck in this traffic that moves yeah. at a very slow pace. But when they described it to me and we started to, to look at it because you can have, it's such a longer path that the car should just continue to move very slow, sl uh, excuse me, very smoothly through the path. Um, that is the goal. I mean, we'll, we will be out there again, really encouraging parents to come into the parking lot. Um, I do know because some parents will sit there and they'll talk to their kids and it takes them forever to get their kids out of the car. That's where the bottleneck comes. Well, you, you have a bottleneck too when parents uh, going into their into the lot turn right and circle around the, the north hand side of the parking lot versus the parents that turn attempt to go straight and turn left in front of the, uh, the multi-purpose room, the existing multi-purpose room. Oh, and they that tends, they, they, they tend to block one another too. Correct. So uh, the, your, the flow in that, that flow doesn't change. So uh, in the new design, so it just it, again it just appears to me that that you guys are you're it, it's a wonderful design other than other than this from my perspective, it it just it, it makes sense from my perspective to have some sort of assurance that this thing is going to work, um, before you start committing to you know to building this thing out. So. Uh, there are two, in the new design, the only people going to the right are buses. Everybody else is going to the left and they, sh they are not going to, they, they're not gonna be dropping their kids off in the front. They need to go all the way around to the side by, by the gym and drop their kids over there. That's the plan. Okay, because there are, uh, at least in the design I'm looking at, there still are parking spaces over to the right of oh. the entrance. Yes, parents can park their car, but if you're just going through to drop off your student, you need to drop them off in front of the gym. I see. Because from my understanding, there are fences all along, 
So there's no way their student can't get in. They'd have to walk all the way around to the gym area just to get in. Am I right on that, that one? Yes. Okay. Yeah, one of the things that we talked about a lot in, in this type of design, and, and obviously the neighborhood hasn't seen it yet, is a cultural change, and it's a good one. Um, once, for example, once a kid and a parent realize they could pick themselves up or be at, at an experience right on the curb, possibly a lot closer to their classroom versus across the street or even down the street, they will change culture and do this instead. That's our experience. Okay, um, I know traffic and uh, circulation on campus is with cars and everything is one of the huge topics that we wanted to address tonight. I don't want to cut this conversation off early. Um, I do think, Mr. Reese, are you satisfied that you made a compelling argument for a traffic study? And if I put your hand down, I can I, move? I, I, yeah, you can put my hand down. I, I do feel that you've heard me. Uh, I still would like to see a traffic study. Okay, thank you for your comment. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, the Cunninghams who are have their hand raised. Cunninghams. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah, I had comments rather than a question. Um, I think your uh, traffic plan is making an awful assumption, assumption in that the turn into the main entrance is quick and easy for cars. It's not. It's a terrible bottleneck. And that's what contributes to all these other traffic problems. And that's when parents decide not to go into the lot and try to find another place to park. Um, and under your plan, you're funneling more cars into that bottleneck. And that includes the teachers and the staff because you've taken away their entrance. And that entrance has become an exit. Um, I think you're creating a real problem with that bottleneck. Um, uh, about a year ago, April is about a year ago, the school district circulated a plan for improving the traffic mess here. And that plan involved splitting the main lot into two separate lots with a separate entry and exit for each. The cars coming from the south would use the south lot. The cars coming from the north would use the north lot. That seemed like a pretty good solution to me. It wasn't done for some reason. Um, the other nice thing about that plan was it had a nice safe walkway from Barrett into the entrance to the school. Uh, looking at your layout here, uh, you've got a number of students they are gonna have to cross, uh, they're gonna have to walk alongside the traffic lane and cross lanes. And as I read the educational code, uh, section 14030, that's not acceptable in new construction. So uh, we keep talking about a traffic plan. I just wish somebody would go out and look at that bottleneck at the entrance and try to calculate how you're gonna get cars in to pick up all these kids uh, in the time that you've got and with that bottleneck you've got. So I, I can comment on a couple of those items. Um, the original flyer that went out last year, April, was done by the original architect. And since then, uh, looking at some of the items that were problematic for student path of travel and ADA path of travel, um, changed some of those items, as well as the code section that you stated. That's one of the main reasons we meet with California Department of Ed. Um, they have specific requirements on foot traffic and conflict with vehicular traffic. Um, we've already met with them and got preliminary approval on the current layout, um, which is one of the most important things to do to get from them. Because um, that's one of the items that more than likely gets changed down the road if you don't get pre-approval from uh, Department of Ed. Um. 
I also do recall that scheme and we, we didn't tear it up or anything. We, we, we just proceeded on, on trying to resolve the issue. But one thing that it, it did, we felt that, I, I know you're describing more entrances or easier entrances, but the parking lots that they created were too small to mitigate the things that we were trying to get off the street. So this is a simpler design. Also, the, the, the main ramp that was down the middle there was assuming that a lot of people would get dropped off on the street. And that was kind of working against the scheme that it just created. So we, we recognize that, we tested it a little bit. We didn't think it was better than this one. Um, but I will say something about perhaps your, your comments about entrance and how hard it is to get in. Perhaps it's maybe uh, the, the radius to get in that we could improve or something like that, because I, I do know what you're talking about there. And it's probably more of the left turn people uh, trying to get in, uh, you know, conflicting with the right turn people. I know I, I observed that also. Um, again, hopefully with less people on the street, that occurrence would be a little bit easier. And maybe we could look at um, making sure the entrances may be wide enough, if you will. Uh, but I also, you did also say one thing that the other entrance to the south was an entrance and that's not the way it's designed right now. There's two arrows pointing as exit only. So, um, and, and if they did it in either scheme, I, there'd be a conflict of those people. If you're entering while other people trying to exit, that would create a, an unsafe traffic condition um, on those peak periods. So I didn't observe people coming in the south entrance either, so. Um, Amy, you're, if you're saying something, you were on uh, mute. They do. Okay. So there is, there's like two little roads o o over there. Okay. So people who come in, they do exit out, but then there's another road that teachers can just turn in yeah. and go down. Okay. So sometimes you will have parents who use that road too. They're not technically supposed to, but. Mr. Cunningham is right that there is a, there's two roads, that's why. Okay. Well, it's, it's a wide enough driveway. It's like 35 to 40 feet wide. Um, if we studied it again, I mean, if there's nothing that we can't do there. At least it's wide enough to do that. So. In okay, fact, I'm I, going, yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry, one, one last thing. I think one of the, in working with um, Sac County traffic, they they did not recognize a two-way entrance there. I, is that correct, Nick? I remember the sketch that they gave us back. Yeah, it was uh, the north entrance was two lanes coming in, and then the south entrance, which is currently exit and entrance, uh, entrance for the staff to get to the back parking lot, that will be reconfigured to two lanes out. So essentially, Everyone has to enter at the north, and they're discharging at the south. Okay. Okay, I'm going to go to the next hand that's raised, and it's Mike Laird. Hello. I'm Lori Quarter. Oh, okay. I'm calling in because for some reason, Reason my uh, I've been unable to speak online. Okay. I'm asking you questions, and actually, I'm going to give you comment. My biggest concern is that the community at large was not given a chance to have a meeting or a voice regarding this project until this time. At which time, the first flyer went out in April, hand delivered to a select group of people only and not representative of the population or to be able to give you feedback. And from listening to your current presentation, you have met multiple, multiple times with facility and with staff to recognize their concerns, but not the concerns of the community, which very much concerns me. And the other thing is, is this was in April, 2019. And you had time to listen to them and you chose not to. My other concern is about the amount of population you have and you're only specifying school events. The biggest one is soccer. 
Soccer has six fields that operate at one time. They change on an hourly basis because the games last about an hour. So six fields, if you do the math, you calculate it for two teams on each field at 13 children, approximately sometimes more per team because I used to coach. That's 156 kids that do not drive. That's in one hour. And then when they switch, there's another 156 kids of influx and parents and grandparents that come in. And that's just soccer. That's on a weekend. And on weekend evenings, you have practices. And then if you put in a gym, which believe me, I'm not opposed to your renovation. I think it's wonderful that Barrett's gonna be having something new going on and be presented in a better light. I am concerned that you're not paying attention. And these people are bringing up valid points and you're dismissing them. The environment does have an impact. There's a well back there. So when you decrease the green belt that's back there, you decrease the capabilities of it having water drain into that well. Which is why I'm saying, why cannot you move that gym to the other side where it slopes, which would keep it at a lower level, which the people walking at the top of Barrett can see the vista that is still beautiful. And you could use the upper parking as parking lot. And you could not have as much up there. That there's, and it's close to the street. It, you know, it, there's no reason why you can't use that. The lighting would be there. It's close to the street. The children would be safer to be dropped off up that way. The other thing is, is that you're not thinking about the environment for everybody to use this space. So Mr. Reese has brought up valid points with you in regards to the student population. The student population has changed quite a bit. And there's a direct correlation in facilities uses too. So when you do the facility uses and you have soccer, and you put in a new gym and a new science wing, and you bring all these wonderful things to bear it, guess what's gonna happen? They're gonna have wonderful events. And these wonderful events, if they perform at the same time, are gonna bring wonderful amounts more of traffic. And how much parking space can you do that is gonna offset the roads unless you pay attention to what people are telling you? Um, the other thing is the noise. You put parking lot real close to people's houses. Every time they, somebody gets in and out of a car, a click, click, a bounce, bounce, you know, of their clickers to find their ha keys or such. And then you have lighting. The lighting is so many people go out and bear it in the evening with blankets and things just to look at the night stars or to also just see some of the uh, astronomical events that happen because you have to get away from the lighting to see that. So those are things that the more light you put back there on the fields and such and around the events is you know, gonna take that away. So when you push back that gym and you push it back into the field and you lessen the green belt that's back there, you're also causing a lot of pollution to the environment back there that can't be regained. Once you take it away, we can't get it back. And people enjoy that, their children enjoy that. And like I said, everybody wants to see this happen, but we also want our concerns listened to. And if you actually did a study for transportation and county did it, because when they put in the speed bumps, Mrs. Collins, they had to put them all in an area and everybody within a mile or so radius was informed and was given the opportunity to have a voice. The district has only given these flyers out to a hand delivered select amount of people. And so you don't know what the community has to say. I think there's viable solutions to what you have going on. I think there's better solutions. And then also with the presentation of COVID and things like this, we have no idea where the size of classroom, the changes that are gonna happen, the restructuring. So as unless the community knows, this is gonna be a 24 million plus dollar complex, changes to it. 
And so if changes happen later on that after this little section of COVID goes by, that's going to create more and substantial need for changes within the classrooms and such, it's going to be too late to implement or, or change the plans for those, which will be more costly. And you have to remember that these people need to be heard. These are their bond money, their tax money, their presentation that has given you the ability to do these things, but also it's them getting stuck on the street. And I know that only because when I was taking my daughter to school, if you take a wrong turn on that street, you're stuck. There's no way out. Although parents actually make U-turns right in front of other cars and go on people's driveways and streets. I was once involved, there was a little lady that a uh, child was dropped off at school, ran across the street. She was hit by a little lady that happened to be turning that morning on the street and usually doesn't go at that hour and got stuck in traffic. And guess who dropped her off? A San Juan Unified School District employee dropped their child off on the street at the wrong place, not at the sidewalk, not at your drive through and an accident happened. Emergency rescue squad, they couldn't get through. They had to get out of their vehicles and walk up to the event in order to help the child which was truly not injured. She just was very much shocked. Gloria, so I agree, I agree. when people are speaking, they need to be heard. And I think you guys have to remember that you have a strategic plan. And in, within the strategic plan of the district, it's supposed to allow for people to be heard. You're supposed to reach out to the community. And I appreciate you trying to interrupt me, Mr. Camarda, but I tried to address these issues earlier. And I've sent a letter to the to the anybody that will listen, because I think you need to stop and take another peek at things. I appreciate all the hard work you guys do, but I also see that everybody has been given a voice, your faculty, your student of it, Board of Education, everybody except this community. And this community are the one that pay the property taxes. They have vested interest in their homes. They want to see this succeed just as much as everybody else. So these are concerns that the everybody in the community has. We're concerned about the fence lines, you know, we're concerned about the activities that go on that you know, you have fence lines. I have people that have backed into my fence and taken out a section of my fence because their truck has been backed up there. The school has done leveling and not, um, actually I would say they've done grading and not leveling by survey. And they created flood zone into my yard because it was easier for them not to survey it and just bring out a bulldozer and flatten it. So there's, sections of this property back at Barrett that has been changed over time that is not conducive to the way that the rain flows and things like that that may not have been looked at either. And there's storm drains that used to be used for the school district that are now in the neighboring people's homes. So there's a lot of issues that need to be addressed and most a lot of them are environmental a lot of them are the street and the parking, but you also need to consider that right now, if Barrett was going on, it would just be the current Barrett that was going on and the soccer. And soccer has changed from being just when it used to start in August to end in November, it is now year round. So soccer isn't relieved on those fields and those fields have been beaten up so badly that they could barely come back from themselves. And the other day they were fertilized. I don't know how many hundreds of maybe thousand of dollars spent on fertilizing. They watered them morning and night for about two weeks, shut off the water for over a month. And they had basically hay back there that smelled like dry hay. I had to call the district to ask them to please turn on the water so that the community nearby would not be in detriment of their houses burning if something would happen. So these are concerns that the community has that maybe the district doesn't really take into consideration. And I would appreciate it if you would rethink 
the movement that you're making so quickly and so courageously to get through these COVID times, but to also get this passed so quickly to not listen to people and be heard. And so I left a couple things for Mr. Medina and Mr. Arps. Can you please share with us why that gym cannot be placed over there on the other side where it down slopes? It would be put into a smaller section of the property. And then you have the parking lot up top near the, near the upper field, which would feed directly off of the Barrett Road. It looks like you're already going to take out the trees, the big eucalyptus, according to your renditions, and all the old trees. So why would not that work? Well, Lori, let me, let me go ahead and address the, there's a lot there. Uh, let me go ahead and address that if you're, if you're still on the line. So as Mr. Arps explained a little bit earlier, uh, our process uh, really is to get through the first part of the process, which is the, uh, the program uh, elements of the school and what is educationally adequate for the school and, and supports student teaching and learning. That's the first part of our pro uh, process. The second part of that process is to bring this information to the community and, and, we, and like Mr. Arp said, we wish we could have done this sooner, but with the COVID-19, uh, it was COVID-19 24 hours a day, seven days a week, trying to get us. Uh, May I uh, interrupt you a minute? It was not COVID-19 in April of 2019. April of 2019 was when they originally sent out the flyers and Mr. Yeah. Keith Reed was originally addressed with the community's concern and what he directly expressed to us that there was going to be a community meeting and that they would reach, do a better job reaching out to the community. That is so correct. don't scapegoat on, don't scapegoat on it right now because April Lord. and COVID started in January. Lori, in that time period, we've had uh, the architect that we were working with, uh, we had to separate ways so there was a time period between that but the process I'm trying to explain this is the opportunity for the for the neighborhood to bring their concerns so we are listening to those concerns there are some things that we can incorporate uh, those concerns into our design elements uh, and we can look at the traffic mitigation this is the quick opportunity for the neighbors to weigh in our first part of the process a lot of the neighbors do not know about it because they have not been given the opportunity to know what's going on this is our, like because I said, this you've is only reached out to a small selection of a few with your hand delivered flyers. So all those people who don't have children in school, who may have had children in school and no longer have children in school, all those people who pay taxes, they have not been given the notification or the respect that they deserve by being notified. Okay, well, I appreciate your comments, Lori, and I, I'm not sure that can satisfy you at the moment. Uh, I would not mind meeting with you personally and, and having a conversation with you personally uh, and showing you what we have done uh, to try to mitigate uh, as many of the, w which we thought would be the pinch points with the neighbors. Uh, can we do better at our communication? Yes, I can own that part of it. This is the opportunity for the neighborhood to weigh in on their concerns. I think we're listening. You have a very good team here, a very professional team. Uh, we have conducted about $600 million worth of construction and we have worked with neighbors such as you and others. And, this, and these opportunities to weigh in and to bring concerns, uh, we, we do listen. We do take these into consideration. We do make design element changes. What you're proposing is very drastic. Uh, we're trying to keep our, our, our campus very tight and compact. Uh, like Mr. Arp said, the grade changes, the amount of access compliance, putting it up on that, uh, that top center is not conducive to, uh, to keeping a very compact and secure school. We want most of our students behind the main campus. We live in a very troubled world things do occur on campuses. So we want our kids fenced. We want them back. We want to prevent, present quad areas to where they are secure. Uh, we, have, we are very cognizant of the facility use. Uh, that falls under my our umbrella of responsibility. Uh, we are obligated to provide access through the Civic Center Act for youth sports events. Now, can we control the volume of that? 
uh, we can. So we have to take a look at that. Uh, all of your comments are very well noted. All of Mr. Reese's comments are very well noted. This is an opportunity to go back to the drawing board, take a look at some of the comments and, and potentially incorporate some of that into our design elements. We are committed uh, to having another meeting. Uh, we do this quite often. We First, we have our meetings with our neighbors. Uh, we, we, we listen intently. We decide what we can and cannot do, either uh, what are the constraints of the site, uh, what are the constraints with the Division of the State Architect, California Department of Education, the county. Then we bring that back and say, these are the things we're able to, to, uh, to, to um, mitigate some of your concerns and some of the areas that we cannot due to some of these constraints. So we are giving an opportunity. So if there is a wider audience, uh, I, am, I, am not, uh, uh, I am not opposed to sending out a wider, uh, wider communication and having a better, uh, having more folks weigh in. Uh, I would love to do this in person. I think uh, it would probably um, uh, show the professionals of this team and how much real thought went into this. Uh, and went into it and try to um, at least try to uh, at least upfront believe and think that we know that some of the areas uh, that will be concerns of the neighbors and we tried to mitigate that prior and bring that to you. Um, so we have some work to do. We appreciate all your comments. And I think at this point, I'd love to have an opportunity to meet with you. Uh, I can share information with, with, with you one-on-one uh, -on -one, and we can also come back and have a wider uh, uh, hopefully an in-person. If not, we could do another Zoom. So I'm not opposed to that. So all of the comments are, uh, Mr. Reed is taking notes. Uh, Mr. Medine is taking notes. My construction management team is taking notes. There may be some mitigation efforts that relieve some of the frustration. Uh, I apologize. Our communication uh, can improve and we'll commit to that. Uh, but we really want to keep this exciting project going. Uh, and for all those uh, things that I have explained a little bit earlier, uh, on why we thought through the safety and compaction of that particular site. Um, so having said that, give us an opportunity to digest all the information that you shared and others have shared, and there'll be another meeting to where we can start bringing back potentially some solutions or things that we just cannot commit to, uh, because it would have a drastic impact, not only with cost, uh, but what our, with, what, uh, what our goal is in keeping a very tight, compact and secure campus uh, and improving the traffic conditions and the traffic flow. So give us that opportunity. Uh, we would appreciate that. Um, so if you would, you have my email, uh, I would love to have a conversation with you uh, uh, offline if, that, if that's uh, something that you would like to do. Um, so from there, Keith, uh, did you, well, did you like want to get- to, uh, Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me, Mr. Kamai? Yes. Okay, I'd just like to say, the place that I'm proposing for your gem is not on the upper label, upper level. It's on the lower level, across where the current um, locker rooms are currently, which is a lower level, which only half of it would protrude above the upper level. That's where our science wing, I believe, is. Right. It, it is. And you could put the science wing on the other side because it's smaller would lessen the amount of concrete that is taken away from the green belt. And if you included the parking lot on the upper field, which would be more conducive to the traffic in and out on the upper street, it would be very, and it would still allow people to use the Vista as a view. I think it would be, we it's would a be possibility. Yeah, so I just wanted I to make sure you understood that I did not insinuate that the gym be put on the upper level. And that way, only half of that upper level would have to be used for parking, and the rest of it remained green belt. And then there's still plenty of room on the other side to put your science. It's just kind of like flopping them. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank and, you. And, and leaving as much of that green belt back there and much as the side green belt back there as possible would be a select possibility. And, and I'm not frustrated. I am frustrated at the process a bit because I think you tried to avoid including the public. So I hope you will have another meeting and send out flyers to at least a mile radius because those are the people impacted by the street and the parking. It goes that far. 
They take a wrong turn and they're stuck for 20 minutes, half hour, trying to get through Barrett traffic. And that's not during, just during school. It's sometimes during soccer. Okay, thank you, Lori. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, our next question is from our Loretta Langston. Uh, Loretta, you've been enabled to talk. And just before you start, Loretta, um, just to let everybody know, we are at uh, 718. The meeting's scheduled to 730. Um, I want to respect everybody's time. Uh, so we probably will close the meeting at around 730, but we're open for emails. Everybody sign up if you haven't already for the email list. Uh, we will be sending out more information. Loretta, it looks like you're good to go. Loretta, are you there? Loretta, it looks like you're muted and now unmuted. Almost had it. Well, I, I think uh, Loretta's having some issues with her microphone, perhaps. While we're trying to find out if Loretta can um, be heard, I'll go over a few of the more of the comments that are on the Q&A chat. Um, Paul did uh, chime back in and ask, he backed up Lori's comments about notice that while we received the flyer about this webinar, I know that my next door neighbor on Pinecrest did not receive it. My wife and I felt necessary to copy the flyer and distribute it to all our neighbors on Pinecrest and Forest Hill. Thank you, Paul. Um, your distribution was spotty at best. Uh, we, we took a radius right around uh, what we thought would be um, the most impacted neighbors for this meeting as a neighbor, uh, as a neighbor meeting, uh, like Frank said, uh, I'm happy to widen that uh, distribution area next time uh, that we have a meeting. And definitely when we get to uh, more of the events like the ground breakings and the ribbon cuttings and the uh, beam signings and the different things that we do throughout construction, we'll have more opportunities for more people. And uh, my what I love the most is when we get to include the students, and I know that's Amy's favorite part too. So um, we're excited for all of those things to happen once we get back into school and we get to um, incorporate the kids. Um, so that answers Mike's question there, or I'm sorry, Paul's question. Um, Carolyn asks, often during soccer and other activities, the gates to parking have been locked, pushing traffic into neighborhoods. Will gates be locked during soccer and other activities? Uh, we, uh, we issue keys uh, to the uh, different facility user groups. Uh, they have access to open the gates and lock the gates. Uh, so we will be mindful of uh, them keeping those gates open and making sure they lock them. Uh, we also have custodial coverage uh, when we have events like that in, in particular situations. and. Uh, those gates should be opened um, and those keys are issued to each user group uh, to be able to access the campus and uh, also to shut it down. Um, so we would, we would hope that they would open those gates up and that they will lock those when they leave for the night. Okay, uh, Lori also asked, you will be losing 14 classrooms. Have you added 14 classrooms? Um. The classroom count remains the same as it is now. Uh, I mean, if you look at the uh, the map, all the portables on the south are gone, and the middle uh, finger wing is gone. We're only adding six science classrooms and in a, in a band room and a um, drama room. So it looks like we're, we're pretty balanced in terms of what, what we're taking out and, and adding back. OK. Um... Do you know how many teams are on the soccer field at a time? 
Uh, I do not at the moment, uh, but th that's a good question. And note that I can get that information from the facility user uh, liaison and, uh, and present that, that information at the next meeting. I will say though that the site plan does show uh, graphically what could be, what could fit. We only could draw three regulation soccer fields on, on there. There can't be a, there can't be more than that, I guess, in, in terms of playing, but um, that's what fits with the green space available. I could give historical facility use when it comes to soccer, Max, so I can, I can provide historical data on uh, the level of uh, soccer, age levels, age ranges, um, uh, different programs and how many folks are out there, what, what particular soccer groups, uh, sport groups are out there. So I can provide historical data for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jerry and Julie ask, are there any plans for stoplights in front of Barrett? Uh, there, are, there are no plans. Uh, that's typically a county responsibility for stoplights or a Caltrans grant opportunity, um, but no, not at this time. Uh, will there be lights on the parking lot? Uh, yes, there will be lights on the parking lot. Um, like Mr. Harps noted, these are uh, LED lighting it will be um, illuminated uh, when there's traffic and there will be dimming uh, and there's also time scheduling that we can schedule those lights to go off uh, at particular times during the night. So it depends on the scheduling of, of those, but yes, there will be uh, lights in the parking lot for safety purposes. Okay. Um, will the temporary road uh, be dirty and or dusty. I think we answered this briefly at the beginning, but Ryan, uh, can you repeat that? Yeah, well, uh, it'll be compacted gravel or rock. It won't be dirt. Um, we'll keep a water truck on it daily. And then, like I said earlier, any uh, tree sweeping measures we need to take, we'll do that. So it shouldn't be an issue. And just for all you neighbors to, to know, any time that uh, something happens where you feel like it's getting too dusty or it's too noisy or that you're seeing anything that you think is a problem, reach out to me directly and I'll be on our team to uh, clean those issues up. Um, it's most effective to come to the district uh, rather than to go to the trailer yourself. So come to me and I'll make sure to help you out the best that I can, um, which will be right away. Uh, yeah, the current project up the street that Ellen hit on earlier over at Little John, uh, a bunch of earthwork occurring over the past year. We didn't have one single uh, dust complaint. So we plan to do the same on Barrett. Uh, we have another question from Lori Ratz. Will the school take on more students than the current amount? I can't remember if we touched on this or not. Uh, all the demographic studies at the time do not show um, uh, large growth at Barrett, some incremental growth, or just um, it'll remain flat. Uh, so we don't really, uh, it's being planned exactly at its, its student population now. Um, we don't foresee the demographic shifting at the moment. I'll be keeping an eye on that. I do the demographic studying for the district uh, as far as student populations within its residence family, amount of transfers out and transfers in. Uh, we do not see any large uh, growth uh, at Barrett, so it's being planned um, at its current pod, maybe it's just a little tiny bit above its population, uh, but no expansive growth um, uh, beyond its capacity that we're building on. So it is, it is not. Uh, just a follow up to the question about the 14 classrooms being taken out. Uh, you lost 14 classrooms with portables in the middle finger. If I think I'm understanding this right, Max, isn't the what you're putting back in the science building? Yes, it's, it's the same. Um, yeah, I did a calc right now. We, we are exactly the same um, number of classrooms as there are now. Teach, they call them teaching spaces. Um, yeah, and to elaborate a little bit more on that, some of the existing wings at House Science only had two classrooms in them, and now those are being converted to House 4 classrooms. So as we lost a wing, we're reconfiguring the existing wings 
um, to absorb some of those classrooms and to keep the site balanced. Not to mention uh, the, some of the portals that are going away with drama and art, drama specifically, it's moving into the MP room and some of the adaptive PE and special education services are not only going into the MTSS special education wing, but also into the old locker room trying. So it may not look like it's going in different spaces than are shown right now. Okay, we have two more hands and this is gonna be um, the last two questions that we take at this time. Uh, one of them, Mrs. Quarter, I, I'm gonna go ahead and let Loretta talk first because you have had uh, quite a bit of time uh, tonight and Loretta has not been on there yet. So it, let's try Loretta again. Hi. Hello. Hi, we can hear you now. Yay. <laughs> I want to say quickly, we have lived in our house almost 40 years. We are the fourth house um, on Rampart from Barrett. So we have seen the changes when the parkland was sold and houses were built. We have our, our we deal with the, the, the issues of parking. I really, really strongly oppose, and I know it's been talked about, no parking up on that up, upper structure. We already have issues with soccer and stuff. So I applaud whoever said not putting parking up on, backing up on those houses on the upper level. Um, also, I know it's not going to happen yet, but in 2001, when the new lighting went on the north part of campus, I know, I know the first lady that spoke said the lights go down. They don't go out. Well, they do go out because it's on our patio. So I did talk to a gentleman um, in 2001 at the district office, showed him pictures, and he said, oh, okay, we'll go adjust them down. So my, my thing when it, you guys start installing lights, is maybe check with the neighbors to make sure when they're installed, they don't shoot on our patio, they do indeed shoot down. That's it. No big deal. <laughs> okay, thank you, Loretta. Uh, and, and I applaud it, I, I know it's tough. I've worked for the district, um, I've worked at different schools, and I know it's a real pain to do this, but we appreciate all you guys are doing for the students, the neighbors, and everybody else, so thumbs up. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. And our last question, uh, Mrs. Corder, you have the last question. Is there a possibility that those portables can be used for recycling or, I mean, recycled to be used like for homeless or for the fire victims? Can you repurpose them? Um, and the other question is, as as I understand the last woman's concern about that she has enough with soccer and this, that, and the other thing, I'm on the other side along with several neighbors and we feel the same way. And I have the parking lot, which is why I said if they did park up on the upper half, do not make the parking go all the way to the fence that you leave a large green belt there and just use half the upper field for parking which would eliminate the lights being in her, directly in her view, which is what the people on this side with the parking already have in our eyesight. Um, my backyard's lit up at night. Uh, I have to have the shutters shut in order to have night. So. Is there a possibility for the portables to be repurposed? I can address that because, just because we simply um, remove portables, the district and the state architect requires that those portables be safe no matter where they go. So the district has to track those and they, they're called DSA applications. They're, they'll either be um, stored on, a, on another property, if used, turned into the same classroom it is, or stored with a fence around it. The district cannot be in the business of giving away a building that's not safe, and that means DSA safe. So there are different standards that schools designed by, so in terms of that comment, um, unless they're just simply demolished, that's basically the only thing that's available to the district in, in my experience. Maybe we could reach out because this time is going on and ask somebody within the governor's office if there's a possibility of just instead of trashing them, if they are of sound quality, since they have HVAC units, they may be not the best thing in the world, but it's somebody's blessing instead of their burden. 
And that's what like Max just mentioned. Um, we will evaluate them. Um, obviously they're occupied right now and we will occupy them through the duration of the construction. Um, and they'll be the last item to be demo or to be addressed. Um, if they're, like we said, if they're in sound condition, we'll move them to our stockyard for future use. If not, and if, if we don't need them and we are able to unload them, we, we can definitely reach out to neighboring school district, charter schools, church groups. Um, and usually we talk to them and um, it kind of works, sometimes works out in our favor because we just say, come pick them up. It's on your, you know, you gotta, you're responsible for picking up. And there, there might be some legal items, just uh, relieving liability that we'll have to follow through on. But we, we definitely try not to demo too much stuff. We don't want to add to the landfills, um, especially if items have useful life left in them. Okay, that's all the questions that we have from the community. Uh, thank you all for coming uh, to our meeting tonight. Um, I will let you all know that are still here that this meeting has been recorded. I am going to be posting it to our website, www.sanjuan.edu slash Barrett mod. And it will take a couple days because we do have to generate captions for that, uh, for people that have hearing disabilities. But um, I will be posting that on that website and we'll be reaching out uh, through the email list. So please, please, please sign up. Uh, I'll let Ms. Cart Alexander Carter know that uh, that email list I will make public to your staff and anybody else uh, at the schools, parents, students, whoever wants to be on it. Um, tell them to go to that website and I'll work with you on maybe a, one of your school newsletters or all calls uh, to get that information out to the whole uh, school. Uh, does anybody else, Frank or Nick, have any parting, parting words before we sign off? I just wanna thank everyone um, for the opportunity to speak with us and for us to speak with you as well. Um, like we iterated earlier, we, we really hope that this would have been sooner than later because um, we do, make an effort to try to reach out to community and kind of reach out to the, the nearest neighbors um, at the first round because um, they're the ones most impacted for this. Um, and obviously we, we, we can always learn from some of these items and better ourselves as we move forward um, given the opportunity. So I just want to thank everyone uh, tonight. I'd like to do the same. Um, th thank you neighbors. I appreciate all the feedback and input. Uh, we really would like to um, to build some excitement around this project. Uh, this is a building that has not really had much attention since uh, the, since it's built in the 1950s. There's been some modernizations that have done. Uh, we appreciate uh, the generosity of our voters in passing tax bonds. So this is uh, this is possible. Uh, I believe San Juan is in a uh, I'd like to call a transformational phase, and Barrett is part of that, that transformation. Uh, we are committed, the board is committed to bringing educationally uh, adequate facilities uh, uh, to all students within San Juan. Uh, we're very excited about it. Uh, we would like to, um, uh, we would like to uh, bring some of that excitement to the neighborhood. Uh, we, we hear your concerns. Uh, we hear, the, uh, uh, we, we hear um, those concerns uh, and we note those concerns and we will be working uh, behind the scenes uh, to take a look at some of those and see where can we, we can incorporate some improvements potentially in uh, our approach to this project. Uh, we definitely appreciate your feedback and we will be coming back to you. Uh, but we would like to say that we are very excited to uh, start transforming Barrett into a modern campus, uh, not only for the students and for the teachers that are there daily, but for the neighborhood. Uh, so when you walk down those streets, you can see a very modern, beautiful campus uh, within that the beautiful sunk down area on that Barrett property. So again, thank you very much uh, for your input tonight. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, everyone, have a good night. Uh, we'll hopefully be talking to you very soon.